afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Futurescape Virtual and to the Great Soil Debate. Today I'm joined by Tim O'Hare, John Coles, Drew Weverall, Andy Spetch and Mark Wood. Shortly, I'll just ask them all to do a very quick introduction about themselves and the companies that they work and represent. Soil is at the heart of every landscaping uh, project and it's very, very important. The number of times we're told that there's issues with the soil or something's gone wrong with the soil, which can be really, really costly. And sometimes you think maybe that's down to a lack of education, a lack of knowledge. And maybe even sometimes it's down to people buying the wrong, the wrong products and maybe because it's the cheapest price. And I guess they're all kind of things that we can explore today and find out how, as an industry, we can make sure there's less mistakes made on purchasing soil, how we can make sure that the product that is bought is the product that's suited for the area that's there, and maybe look at some of the tips and tests that we can do to secure that. So I'm just going to ask the panel, first of all, thank you all very much for joining us and good afternoon to you all. Uh, if I start with you then, John, if you can just give us a quick introduction and also about the company. Okay, so I'm John Coles from Berry Hill Landscape Supplies, and we're more of a bespoke topsoil manufacturer and concentrate more on the niche products and the bagging and wholesale of bespoke topsoil products for um, projects in the southeast mainly. Yeah, hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tim O'Hare, uh, Tim O'Hare Associates. Um, I've been a soil consultant to the landscape industry for about 25 years now. Afternoon, uh, Drew Weatherall from Born Amenity. Um, we specialise in making subsoils, substrates and uh, everything that you're going to need to grow in. And um, we cover the length and the breadth of the UK. Hi guys, my name is Mark Wood from Green Tech. Uh, we're the UK's uh, leading supplier of products into the soft landscaping market. A large part of our business is uh, soils and growing media underneath under the Green Tree brand of products. Oh yeah, Andy Spetch uh, from British Sugar Topsoil. I've uh, been working in topsoils for probably over 40 years, but running the business for British Sugar now, uh, producing uh, both topsoils, subsoils and top dressings for 25 years. Excellent. So I'm going to start, and I guess, Tim, maybe as a completely independent on this, you might be the best person to ask him. Why is it so important that the choice of soil for landscapers and designers and architects, when they're specifying, why is it so important that they get that right? Uh, well, I suppose soils serve several functions now. We obviously think of them uh, as, a, as a growing medium for the plants that are going to go into a landscape scheme. Um, but if it's now being recognised the other functions of soil, such as uh, their use in SUD schemes, so sustainable drainage, uh, and also they use as a, as a mechanism for remediating uh, contaminated sites. The soil is an important component as it's the, it's the final clean cover, as they say. Um, so, uh, you know, um, so soils are associated with planning permissions, with uh, housing warranties, all these things. So getting the right soil in to, to tick all those boxes is, is really important. And, and, and I guess a question on that, uh, and what is the knowledge like within the landscaping sector? So landscape architects, designers and landscapers, what's their knowledge of soil and, and choosing soil like? Um, I think the awareness of soils is much, much better. Um, you know, uh, social media, um, trade publications like yourselves, you know, it's on. It's it's much more. Uh, you know, on the plan at the moment. Um, people's knowledge of it is 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 variable. Some people, um, you know, often they've been they've been caught short on 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 projects and things have gone wrong, and they've learned from mistakes. Um, other people take a keen interest in it. Other people less so. It's it's just a bit of topsoil, so it's variable. But I think the overall awareness is much better these days. And Andy, so twenty five years, thirty years. Have you seen? people's knowledge grow and what, what's your feeling about the actual knowledge out there in the sector? Uh, yeah definitely I, I think uh, although the British standard has its critics uh, I think the revising of that back initially I think it was 2007 uh, and then the introduction uh, of the subsoil standard, th those things I believe have, re have really helped the market and helped drive uh, the, the market in the right direction uh, and improve people's awareness of it. Uh, 
when you look across the industries that use topsoil, I think there is still quite a variation. I've, and I'm generalising here, but I find landscape contractors generally uh, do uh, have, have good knowledge and, and awareness and how to handle the soils well, because uh, they're often at the very end of the chain and need to pl put the plants out and, and sometimes have to guarantee the scheme. So they do understand and, and I find generally those guys very good. I think the one area that I would like to see improve further uh, and, and have for some time now, and Tim's been helping here an awful lot working here, is, is around uh, the developers, house builders. Uh, some of them are taking it into their own hands and improving their own standards, which is great, but there's quite a gap there and I do see some very worrying, concerning things. Okay, we're, we're, we're coming to that. Mark, what, what about you in terms of your client base and the knowledge? Um, I, I think, yeah, there's varying degrees um, of knowledge base throughout, um, you know, the whole spectrum of people who, who are coming to us, be it for uh, projects at design stage or contractors ready to take the product in at that point. I think sometimes probably it's a case of people looking to find the perfect soil and trying to specify what would be the ideal soil um, but kind of regardless of the geography of where the project is what could be found locally or what is actually possible to, to manufacture from a uh, bespoke sort of nature as well so that's probably more going back towards the design element of it really um, but I think you know landscaping's the final part of a project a lot of the time and it's the most visible part of the project um you know when a, when a project's finished you want contractors and designers and clients want it to look fantastic and landscaping um gives so much to that so i think just just getting it right first time um getting the right soil looking for um credible products and then making sure the areas are prepared properly as well because a lot of the time when there's a problem with the growing media, it's always the topsoil that's blamed, but there's so many other factors as, as Tim and Andy and Drew and everyone's aware. You know, if the subsoil's not prepared correctly or, or there's drainage elements that haven't been taken into consideration, they can all play uh, major factors into what could be the failing of, uh, of a soil application. Okay, John, same question. Um, so we find the same, the, from, the main problem we find is from the, the communication from the top down and the, the landscapers doing the projects don't necessarily have the sight of the specification or understand what the material is required for the end purpose and we tend to find that we can quote the same job for five or six different contractors and you might get sent a specification from one of them but the others will just ask for British standards and you know that there's site specific criteria that a normal British standard soil wouldn't be suitable for and the when you there seems to be a communication issue and, and understanding from landscapers that if there's a big project then the first question they should ask is what is the specification what is the site requirements for this project and it should be the landscapers asking that question when they're specifying and then that's a big part of the buying process. So we find the communication element is the issue that there is a knowledge of the right product there, but people just don't know the specifications or the projects. And I think from a client point of view, they need to have controls in place that when tenders are issued and stuff like that, that the specifications are, are clearer. Um, yeah. And that's the main minute of the work that goes into the specifications. Drew, do you want to add anything on that? But it's not being followed by the landscapers. Um, yeah, so we, uh, we've we seen a much greater um, understanding of soils over the last few years, particularly sort of the last two, three years. Um, I think a lot of that's helped through coming down from uh, the architects uh, and designers. Um, I know there's a lot more CPDs going on with them at that sort of level, and that sort of has that trickle-down effect through to the main contractor, down to the end user at the landscaping level. Um, which is great, um, but similar to what John's mentioned, we do get, again, you know, asked several times for the same project. Um, some give you the specification, some don't. So uh, we try and guide them and, uh, you know, give them the understanding of why you're trying to hit a ses uh, site specification compared to just, you know, your, your book standard BS3882s, which is a you know, great guide to go on. 
some of these uh, sites do need that site specification. And um, yeah, just, just getting them to understand that, it's slowly trickling down. So yeah, it's, it's been a lot better. Why, why wouldn't they give you the specification? Because it sounded like they're saying that they didn't want to give it to you or they, or they just don't know. Or why wouldn't somebody give you the specification? It, it depends really. Um, a lot of the a lot of the landscaping companies, they have separate departments. You know, you have your procurement, you have your buying, and then everything sort of trickles down through to the contractors on site. So depending on whether you've got people trying to do a multitude of platforms or the jobs of the role, sometimes they, they give you the specifications, sometimes they don't. Um, sometimes it may be that they've not been given it by the main contractor. So there's, a, there's a few various reasons why that may not happen. But uh, more often than not, we can normally find it. And often when there are specifications, uh, there's a lot of testing before uh, it, it gets imported. So we normally can catch it at that stage as well before it actually starts going in. So Andy, you mentioned British standards then. Is, uh, what, it, it, the impression I got for you that it's okay, but it's not great. Yeah, well, it's the way it's used. I think uh, like with any, spec sometimes uh, they they uh, they get used in the wrong way uh, and it it can happen if people are, are rushed and not putting enough thought into what they need uh, and they just go well yeah get some soil we just want British standard they've not as Mark well and Drew have, have said they haven't thought about what exactly that project needs and it might you know, it might need a soil's got a bit more organic matter that if you had it tested would throw it outside the British standard, but it would be right for that particular scheme. It might need a higher sand, uh, might uh, need to be extremely acidic or alkaline or something, but I think it's misuse of it. It's, it's not the standard that's wrong, it's misuse of it and people just pulling it off the shelf, photocopying it and saying, this is what I want. I, I, when you say misused by people selling it or people um, buying the soil? I, I, was, I was really referring there to, to people buying the soil. Right, okay. Hmm. okay. And so, so Tim, what, what's your thoughts on the British Standard then and the way it's being used by the landscaping sector? Yeah, I think, I think that's right. Um, I mean, the British Standard is a, it's intended for soils that are moved or traded around the place. It's not, it's not intended for soils which are left in situ. Um, and it, it's, it's a general standard um, that's intended for sort of typical soft landscape uses. Um, but it still has a very broad range of, of uh, some of the parameters that are set in it are very broad range. And so you can have, you know, uh, sand content from 30% up to 85%. Um, and I think um, pe people often, uh, the designers often use it for circumstances when it's not intended, such as um, green roof pro projects or sud systems or various other sort of high spec projects. And they, the, the expectation is because it says BS on it, it must be high, high quality and suitable for everything. And it's just not really the case. I mean, as a standard, overall, I think it's really good. Um, as Andy said, it, it's it's raised the, the raised the minimum standard, if you like, for general purpose topsoils. Um, uh, but I mean, there, there, there's some there's uh, there's two things. Firstly, that, I mean, the one thing I would change in it is the the permissible amount of silt and clay that's allowed in these soils, um, because these soils are ones which are moved, traded, stripped, stockpiled, put in back to lorries, and so on. Um, Anything with, with say more than 40% silt or more than say sort of 25% clay um, ha has huge limitations. Um, we, we live in a, a, a maritime temperate climate where it's wet a lot of the time. Those sorts of soils with very high silt and clay contents just completely deteriorate um, as soon as they're handled and moved. So, uh, and that's not clearly stated um, when people specify the topsoil. That goes in, goes in hand with the fact that People focus on there's there's one main table table one in in the in the standard and people uh, if the soil passes uh, the criteria set out in that table they they think it that's it we can do anything with that soil uh, because it meets the, the, that table 
but there's a huge amount of other guidance and requirements in the standard involved with soil depths. What, what are the required uh, depths, sensible depths for placing topsoil? Um, also, how best to handle it. I mean, there's a, there's a clear criteria in there about only handling the soil when it's dry and friable, or not necessarily dry, but certainly when it's friable and non-plastic. Well, people completely ignore that. If they buy a soil that's uh, met the Table 1 requirements, they just use it all year round, and that, that's not the case. So I, I think going forward, people have to understand that the British standard is a guidance document. It's not a legislative document, for one. And secondly, not just to focus on whether it pass or fails, table one requirements, but actually read the rest of the document to see whether it fits the specific criteria, the program uh, um, for, for any, any particular project. Yeah. And as, as, as a supplier then, John, what, what's your views on British Standard? And when people ask you for British Standard, so what, what, what's your feedback to them? Um, I think the actual British Standard is good as a guide, and then if it's expanded upon, and then in particular, like notes three and four, in view of contamination and site-specific criteria, it's a good base. But where it falls down on is people assume that if they've got been given a certificate from the supplier, that that's it, that's the end of the process. Um, but that is just the start. The, the main point is validation. You need to prove that what's gone to site is fit for purpose and meets the specification and meets also the British Standard. And so the piece of paper and the certificate at the start of the process from the supplier from ourselves is just the start. A lot of the projects we're involved with, there's quite strict on-site testing and strict criteria for the reuse of the material on site. And so the original certification is good for a stockpile and it's good as a start to give you an indicator of what that soil's like. But it's really important that you have validation in the form of delivery notes. It's also in the form of on-site testing so that you can show clearly that the material that's on site is fit for purpose. Mark, same, same thing for you really? Yeah, just, just really echoing uh, what, what Tim uh, said and what John said there. I think, it, it, as Tim said, it's a guideline, it's not legislation, it, it's, uh, it's there for guideline purposes. I think it can be used as a bit of a stick to beat as with at times. Um, one thing I would point out is, what Tim said really about table one being so um, prevalent within the, the British standard that people um, miss some of the key parts highlighting about the uh, chemical analysis what needs to be carried out for uh, um, you know for heavy metals and, and contaminants that could be harmful to human health so many a time we've been offered um, soils from people uh, wanting to know if we're interested in buying it to sell on you know it's yet yeah, it meets the british standard and they supply the the data with with the agronomic properties shall we say to table one and then you know when we follow up and say you know where's the chemical analysis they they clearly haven't read or understood the british standard so haven't got that information uh, available i kind of question to all of you but how vigorous is the on-site testing then? so if you specify a soil and you test the first lot and then let's just say you're on that project for a couple of months with lots of different deliveries what, what what's the recommendation recommendation and how often should that be tested yeah it um it varies uh, massively actually um i've seen uh, specifications particularly where it's the sort of covering the human health uh, contaminants um one sample every 25 cube which is effectively almost one one sample every lorry load. Um, I mean that I've seen that imposed by local authorities, which I think is ridiculous. If you if you've tested a soil at source, it's a single source, and you've demonstrated it's it's um, clean and uncontaminated. That that certainly can be relaxed when you come to the validation testing at, on site. Um, I, I would have thought. I mean, for very high performance soils on um, you know something like a green roof or a podium landscape probably something like one in every hundred cube. I mean, we, we typically say um, one in every hundred cube for something like that, um, because these are soils which are being mixed up all the time with very, with maybe several different components. So you do need to double check that everything is right. But also we say a minimum of three samples because um, again, it, it gives you three sets of data to, to look at. Say for example, the first test shows some minor non-compliances. You're never sure whether that's just a one-off or is it consistent through the whole batch? If you get three samples tested, then uh, then you can see whether it's a consistent thing or, or it's it's just a hotspot. Um, 
taking it to the other extreme on big projects, um, you know, it's one every thousand cube um, is, is acceptable. I mean, on the British standard, actually, is one every five thousand cubic meters is the is the testing regime. But but again, there's, that's one that's one failing of the British standard. It doesn't give enough detail on that. That one in every five thousand is assuming that it's from a single source. You know, you've the, the, the top saw we're testing is has is is being is either is going to be or or has been stripped from one big field unit or one big landmass. So the soils are most likely to be very consistent in composition or it's a it's a batch of topsoil that's been manufactured by one of these guys and um you know they, they're they're confident that the components they've used and the mixing ratio they've used in that 5000 cube is is relatively consistent the other thing is that that five that one sample is not generated by going up to the stockpile and taking a shovel full it actually requires 25 samples to be taken from all over and within the stockpile uh, or all over the field and that is combined and, 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 and quartered down and made into a composite sample. So the, the sampling technique is, is as important as the, as the sampling frequency. Um, but I mean, I, I would typically, so on, on projects where you're importing soils on, uh, over, over say a six month period, as the, as the landscape progresses, I think you should probably sampling at least um, every month or every couple of months to just just to confirm that the, 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 um, the soils are consistent in their quality. And, and where, where does the cost for that lie? Where does the cost for it lie? Well, I think it should lie with the, con with the contract itself. Um, it should yeah. be, it should be uh, put into the bill of quantities for the project so that it's, it's picked up ultimately by the, 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 client, the client at the end of the day, but certainly by the contractual process in the system. Um, again, as, as John said, uh, soil suppliers, all, all these gentlemen um, have their soils tested to, uh, on a regular basis to confirm that their product has the right quality. Um, but I mean, I just literally read in a, in, um, a value engineering uh, email yesterday for a project where the main contractor was questioning why the landscape contractor had allowed for um, independent soil testing once the soils arrive at site. And the main contractor was saying, um, the QS obviously, he was saying, why, um, well, we don't need to bother with any of that because the soil suppliers are expected to provide all the test data for the soils. Well, this is about 7,000 cubic meters of soil. Um, why should the soil supplier pay for all that? The soil supplier should provide an indication of the quality of their soil, but the testing for the, on the ongoing testing should be built into the contract for the specific job it's used for, I think. And, and how often is there variation between the testings in terms of what, what the results come back? Um, it, it can be quite significant. Yeah, it can be quite significant. We've, 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 we've tested different batches of soils and, um, and the compost that's been used or the, 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 chap on the chap on the loading shovel doing the mixing has changed and the, the, it's either skewed out progressively uh, over a period of time or it's significantly different. Other times we, we're testing and the, 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 the contractor bringing in the soils has decided to change supplier halfway through. So, and you can quite, quite clearly see in the numbers uh, and, and sometimes visually that the soils have changed and he's bringing in a potentially a cheaper soil or one which is less um, refined um, and, and there is a significant difference. I mean, if it's all being made correctly, then there isn't a difference um generally but um you know contracts as they run over a period of time do the soils can vary yeah I, and i guess no, to the suppliers more how much pressure is there on the price of the soil rather than on the quality and and the service that's coming on there so yeah, how much is bought on how much it's going to cost rather than the, the backup and the support john i would say that's primarily the driving conversation for every tender and every inquiry is it's very price driven to start with and then it's normally a secondary thought as to specification most of the inquiries we get especially on the larger scale projects it will be very price driven it would just be a case of 10,000 ton of British standard soil to this address and then they would initially ask for arctics because it would be cheaper and they just want the cheapest price as the driving point and then it's normally as the dialogue starts that you start to ask the questions about specifications about site access and then you then develop a conversation and then normally that's when other stuff comes out of the woodwork and then they you actually end up tailoring your soil and then it then becomes a secondary conversation but the driving factor is always priced to start with and we 
we kind of have to have uh, we have about 17 different soils because we have to cater for quite a lot of different markets and the we but even you, there's a limitation as to what we will engage in as to our lowest price point as to our our products because there is a point where the people here today we will focus on the market but there's a lot of competitors that focus on recycled elements and the cheaper end of the market and you it's not necessarily the same product and if it goes to site they might get away with it but nine times out of ten now with the validation testing you can't and so it needs to be a, a premium product and that needs to be reflected in the price and they just same is it uh, a little a little different in our case i'd say I'd, if i put percentages i'd say probably 60 40 so 60 is on price but first and foremost like john said the first part of the conversation but 40 percent uh, which has increased, I think, over, over the, the the years, uh, is where people will say, uh, you know, we we were specifying your soil. We want to use your soil because they might have used it previously, or or they know somebody else has been used it and it's been recommended to them. Uh, been yeah, been specified. No, uh, yeah, probably similar to what to what Andy said. We're seeing more and more where. Um... People are looking to use our soil specifically, similarly, because they've possibly used it on a project before. Um, going back to what John mentioned earlier, we've had occasions where we've negotiated on contracts to win the order on soil supply. Uh, and then when it's come to the 11th hour, just prior to looking to start arranging for deliveries, a specification pops up that was never discussed at any point leading up to this point. It was being you know British standard topsoil which we can supply which can uh, give our paperwork to prove and then as I say the 11th hour a, a specification pops up and it goes from Arctic's to eight wheelers but they want it for the same price but uh, but yeah it's, it's it, going back to what Andy said yeah I think there's more there's more specification sales coming um, and I think that is gaining more momentum as, as people are uh, realizing and working with with soils within our industry that that um, they want to get high quality um, soils first and foremost as opposed to paying the cheapest price perhaps or maybe I'm thinking about an ideal world <laughs> and, and Drew and I guess the other thing is well well Drew that maybe you, you can add to that is, is well it's like distance you're you're taking the soil from uh, Kent to London doesn't sound bad, but Kent to Leeds does sound bad. Has that ever come into the into the negotiations and discussions? Um, yeah, hundred um, percent. I think depending on what the specification requires, um, what each site needs. Uh, obviously, you've only got a, a, a limited amount of sites that can produce certain materials. So, um, when you're looking for more materials like suds uh, schemes, they tend to travel a lot further. So the prices of those can will obviously increase because of the transport costs. But um, a lot of the time, the clients generally know that that's going to be the case. So, um, you know, we, we see a lot of suds going on in Wales. So obviously moving materials over there, very costly. Um, so it, it does depend on the, the geographical location. But, you know, again, everyone here, they, they've all got um, sites uh, all over. So you can sort of, you know, help point in the right direction for what's, better geographically, plus speaking the specification, and just ensuring that, um, that, that the project basically finishes off with what they expect um, to, to where they are. I mean, we, we've seen architects that have used materials in London. They've worked very successfully there, and they simply copy and paste them to sites in Manchester or Birmingham. And I'm um, trying to explain to them that the, the cost differences of moving that around, um, they, 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 they sometimes don't quite get that um get get that at the, at the beginning at the tendering stage so sometimes it can be quite um uh, quite a surprise to see the cost of those go through but i wouldn't say that the i would say the cost is is becoming a little less of a necessity and it's just about getting the specification right and making sure that the longevity of the project is, is successful and sometimes the, the cost of that you know is is secondary now because as long as the project succeeds, they know the cost as well. I guess one of the issues, there's always going to be someone that's going to sell it for cheaper, isn't there? And, and that's one of the issues. With, with yeah. the commercial market then, Tim, so I guess 
landscape architects are, are pushing the specification more, but what happens in a domestic market? Uh, is the garden designer's got the same kind of knowledge as landscape architects? How, how, how does it vary in terms of the specification? Some, some use the specification as part of their project, quite a lot don't. Um, I think garden designers work a lot more closely with the uh, landscape contractors. Um, so obviously they've, they've um, well, initially liaise with the clients and produce the design, but when it comes to the implementation of that, um, they have a much closer working relationship with the contractor who's going to install it. Um, and I, I suppose a lot of the time they, they, they're looking for the contractor to advise on what, what soils need to be used um, and imported and, and therefore it, 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 the, the, um, the control of it goes on to the contractor. They're, they're responsible for delivering the package and therefore they're the ones who choose the soils. And, and Andy, do you find there's a difference when, you, when you're dealing with a commercial product and a domestic project? Hey, yes, yeah, so I think firstly just about garden design is what I find nice about the garden design is, is that being quite proactive as an organisation and some of the colleges as well, uh, you know, they'll approach and ask for uh, me to go and give a presentation on topsoil to their students. So you're getting into them at the beginning of their careers, which is helping, you know, upskill them and getting their knowledge. Uh, in terms of domestic, uh, the, the big thing there to, that can be difficult is access and size of vehicles. Uh, trying to explain to people how big some of these things are and that they can't get down little narrow alleyways and the different options there are like bags or grabs and that that can get very very uh, in in depth and take up an awful lot of time sometimes for not that much reward really uh, which is why we tend to focus on the the uh, the bigger commercial uh, projects but can I just come back on that. So, so in the colleges, and how, how well taught is information regarding soil? Does you know, again anyone anyone know that? Has anyone you know, seen what happens as landscapers go through? Like, I don't know if I went to Maris Wood, how much emphasis would be put on making me understand the soil and what soil should be used? Well, I I, I just before this call, I spent four hours this morning giving a lecture to to uh, 20 students uh, at one of the landscape colleges uh, and I probably do three or four of them a year uh, so I think yeah I, I'm finding that, that, that it is part of the syllable. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Tim do you do much for colleges? Um, well the other week um, delivered a CPD for the University of Greenwich um, remotely for a lot of uh, students um, again it's it's becoming more and more specifically at that level um normally it's it's directly with the uh, architects and designers so um to start seeing it coming through at the uh, grassroots while they're in college and university is, is, is definitely picking up it's just um being able to get hold of the right lecturers and people or them reaching out to us to uh, ask those questions and try and get that but I, th I think they're getting a greater understanding and we're seeing a lot more involvement from that level so they can you know, bring that through in their career. How, how, how would you say to a landscaper, you shouldn't buy that soil, even though it's the cheapest, because what, what, what would give them the, the indication that it is, it's not what they, they seem to be buying just because it's pretty standard at a cheap price? What would you say to them is the, is the thing, the question to ask to make sure that they're not just buying it at the cheapest price and it's not really what it delivers. So I'll start with you, John McCann on that. I think it's just important to ask where the materials come from in terms of the source. So is it single source? Is it manufactured? The previous projects it's been used for, I think it's quite important to speak to your supplier and get confidence. Um, we have a project list available um, of previous projects that kind of give people reassurances of where our products are used and how they're used. We, we kind of give people guidance. We will say if they don't know which soil they would like, we might recommend three different soils and send them the specifications and then ask them to liaise with either an architect or a designer and um, to see if they can be guided as to which soils they have or alternatively they have a specification and we will kind of give that as a guide. Um, but I think it's important to know the source of your material, the reliability in terms of when was the testing done versus the current stockpile. So 
uh, stock parts can vary. One of the things we've found, and we probably will have the same experience recently, is the weather. And we've found that our sand content's gone up because what's happened is that as we're going through the trommel screener, the clay and the silt's actually screening out. So even though we've done the same ratios, we've had to now adjust our ratios because of the, the clay and the silt's actually screening out, which made our total sand content go up slightly. Um, and so it's important to understand that. And if a customer was to ask me now, I would say this is our certificate from two months ago, but it's varied slightly because I know that the sand content's gone up slightly. Um, so we, a so source supplier will know their material and know the material. And I think it's important to, to ask the source and, and the how reliable the, the test data is that relies to it. Just, just, to, just on that then, so, so how long does a test certificate last? Um, so we mainly test every three months on all the main soils. And then, but we have a lot of on-site testing in between. Um, so the materials will go in and we know that the testing. So I think most soil suppliers and manufacturers um, we test all the individual elements as well, so we know the makeups of the soil, and we 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 understand from the on-site testing as well. We can identify the issues. Most of our soils are manufactured, um, and because of that, we can adjust the ratios slightly and and to get it and tweak it when we have issues. Um, but the the testing we would say every three months for the main soils, and then depending on if the more bespoke and niche stuff like the, the lightweights, the substrates, we might do six monthly or yearly for some of the more abstract bespoke mixes. Well, in terms of your advice to landscapers? Yeah, just just really. So we we, we just talk through uh, what product has been offered and the comparisons to the products we can offer them. So we'll talk walk them through the process of how we manufacture our our soils. But really, it's, it's case studies are a big uh, thing for us. Uh, we've got a uh, quite a large back catalogue of case studies where we've supplied soils into major projects up and down the country so we can refer people back to the case studies. Um, but provenance is a big thing, uh, as I think John uh, mentioned as well, you know, making sure that uh, what the certificate says they're getting is actually what, you know, what's being supplied. Um, and whether it's single source, but, but yeah, cha challenge the paperwork really, you know, challenge us for data um, we, we as suppliers we should be able to supply up-to-date analysis and also any historic analysis as well to show we do that to show consistency of our products going back you know we can go back four five six years perhaps on historical data which which should give confidence that the products has remained similar throughout that time um so uh yeah reflecting uh, pretty much the same thing so we we tend to always, um, you know, look at how often it's tested. Uh, again, sort of two, three months old. That's, that's sort of roughly what you should be looking at um, for your major, you know, general purpose top soils and stuff. The more bespoke ones might be um, have a slightly longer longevity to them because they're not produced uh, that often. So again, you're looking around that one to two and a half thousand meter cube um, aspect. But it's down to the, 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 the trust between, you know, yourselves, the, the contractor and the architects and small things just like turning up to, to site and actually having um, a visit around where it's manufactured, seeing how it's done. You know, that, that can give a lot of um, confidence through through what's what's been done. And uh, that, that generally goes a long way. And again, but once you've got the data sheets to back all that up, um, that's, that's generally what you want to be looking for. Andy? Yeah, if you haven't got previous experience with that uh, supplier, uh, I think Drew's last points, the, the most important bit of advice I give is just go and visit because, you know, anybody can produce paperwork. Uh, it still might not represent what you're going to get and you can't be going and having a look. You know, people, designers, landscape contractors will go and look at nursery stock, they'll go and look at the trees, they'll look at the shrubs and select them should be doing the same with the soil because if the soil ain't right the best trees and shrubs in the world ain't gonna grow yeah, yeah. so tim just a slight twist on that question um so if you were buying soil what would you expect the the manufacturer to show you and prove to you i wouldn't buy from any of this lot i tell you <laughs> <laughs> i only test their soils i don't buy it um no what i'd be expecting would be as, as they've all said, you know, up-to-date analysis, um, I mean, really the, the validity of any test report is only as, as, as good as the, the length of that soil being present. If, um, 
if you're if you're selling if you're testing every five thousand cube and you're selling that every month, then <clears throat> you should be testing every month really because your next batch of soil has got to got to be validated. Um, in terms of testing, what I've been wanting to see would be a combination of the agronomic horticultural properties to confirm that it's uh, going to function, you know, uh, has the right levels of fertility, either low fertility or high fertility. It's going to drain properly. Um, the pH range is acceptable, those sorts of things. Um, but as, as we've said, you know, it also needs to have a, um, a, a set of contamination tests done for it. Um, to confirm, I mean, and, and this is it, you're mostly trying to confirm that it's not contaminated, you're demonstrating it's not contaminated, and we're not trying to find contaminants. So, um, but I mean, that, as I said, that at the beginning, that serves the purpose of, of not only confirming that the, the soil is going to function as a grain medium, but also that it's fit for purpose from a, from a human health and an environmental perspective. Because the, um, if, if I'm responsible for taking soils into a site or approving soils that have been delivered to site, such as a landscape architect or garden designer might be, um, I'm responsible for that soil. So if, if in six months time it's found to have asbestos in it uh, by, the, by the new homeowner or the, by the new client, um, well, it falls back onto me. I'm the one who's approved it. So I want to have clear, concise information from the soil supplier to start with, backed up then by ongoing validation testing that the soils that I've that I've approved or bought are fit for purpose. And I think everyone's pretty much mentioned things about this single source or multi-source. All the companies talking here um, are dedicated soil uh, manufacturer, soil supply companies. But what we haven't got here on the panel is anybody who, um, the, the companies that are sort of, um, you know, haulage firms, uh, soil recycling firms, waste haulage contractors, um, these sorts of these sorts of companies are also selling uh, soils. I mean, we, we, we invariably call them skip waste soils, but basically, uh, as you know from my talks, you know, um, this is soil that's recovered from sites as demolition, site clearance, skip waste. It's put through screeners. Um, and the fines that come out are sold as topsoil or subsoil. Um, sometimes they sell it as an uncertified soil because they won't guarantee it. But anything, a lot, a lot of these soils get screened and they get put into a great big stockpile. Um, and that stockpile is a continual, continually growing at one end and being taken out at the other end. So they, those companies may show you an analysis which was done a month ago, but it doesn't bear any resemblance to the soil that you're going to be buying tomorrow because that analysis represents a soil that, that doesn't exist any longer. So, so when you, you said about, you know, what are you competing with in terms of if somebody else has got a cheaper soil, you must ask the question of why is it cheaper? Um, these, these guys are paid to take the waste away from sites and therefore they get paid at the front end. So they don't need as much money at the back end when they're reselling the soil because they've already had uh, a nice bit of cash. Whereas all these guys are actually buying uh, the components um, or and processing the components, and then so their margin is margins are much tighter generally. So their their product's going to cost a bit more because it's a better value product. And then the final question for me then before we go to the audience is: in this ever changing world with developments, what what's the next developments in the soil world? What what's on the horizon? Is it you know, what, what's what's the changes? Let's start with Drew. Then what do you see as Horns, next developments and next movements? Well, I think the continued site specific um, source is, is going to continue going forward a lot. Um, the biggest thing we tend to see a big rise in at the moment is, is, is all of the sub materials. Um, obviously, we've seen over the, the last few years how flooding has had a massive impact, and um, the, the designs of suds are now slowly and steadily getting put at the forefront for all these new big housing projects. Um, you know, you're looking at swales, uh, bioretention units, things like that. And, and I think that's going to be one of the big, uh, big pushes going forward. Um, if there, there's one thing to look at with those, I think a lot of the, a lot of the things on top of the British standard would be adding on gradings, such as like five sands. And um, this can help towards things like um, looking at the porosity levels for air and water also help them uh, look at compaction. And um, that, that's a great guide to, to a lot of the materials and pushing forward with the specifications on, on what you can get on sites and being more site specific. John? 
So similar to that, most of our focus has been on uh, a lot of the roofing soils, um, lightweight and intensive and a range of extensive uh, substrates as well. Um, in particular, the bagging and processing of them. So we're developing for next year um, an automated form fill seal machine um, to increase our bag output and to cover another million bags a year. Um, and then that would then help us to, to be able to help because of our location and proximity to London. And um, we're finding more of the, the, basically the substrates and the extensive substrates is where our, most of our uh, growth we see next year. Um, yeah, I think the green roof market uh, north of Birmingham is, is starting to uh, take off greatly now. Um, there is a world outside London for green roofs. Just want to point that out to people. Uh, there, there, yeah. there, is, there, there isn't much of one at the moment, though, is there? And I, I know it's happening, but it's not quite catching up at the speed. No, 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 no. We're a long way behind, but uh, Manchester and Liverpool, big development areas for, for green infrastructure on the whole. Um, but Suds, again, what, what Drew mentioned earlier, yeah, big, big, big opportunities moving forward uh, with the ongoing development of Suds. Um, yeah, we, nobody can avoid the fact that flooding is a major issue for us um, as a country. I think natural soil erosion is, is a, a big, um, big player in, in, in contributing to that. And I'm not sure as yet where we can fit in with um, trying to rectify any of that. Um, but for, for me, for us, for Green Tech, we'll be thinking uh, quite seriously about the uh, UK net zero targets for, for carbon net zero uh, 2050. Seems a long way away, but uh, you know, we've all got to work towards uh, achieving the targets for the UK. Um, so really moving around how we can um, bring that into what we're doing around soil manufacturing and supply, really. Andy? Yeah, I think... One of the major things I'd like to find a soil scientist that you can rely on and knows what he's on about. <laughs> we keep so looking. Any, we any, keep looking. Yeah, well, let me know when you find one. Uh, but, uh, I think that's one all now, Tim. Yeah. So uh, now for, for us as a business, uh, I'm just looking to do do more of, of what I am doing, which is trying to give consistent supply of a you know high quality topsoil. Uh, to the range of customers that I sell to, but yeah. Okay, so what the mistake Andy made there is you've got the last word, Tim, on this thing before we go to the audience. Yeah, I'm not petty like he is on these sort of <laughs> things. No, I've learned, learned over the years to just put up with him. Um, <laughs> anyway, no, uh, I think everybody's, I've got the opportunity to summarize it really in the sense that, yes, I think the bulk volume go, going forward, the bulk volumes are going to be general purpose, multi-purpose uh, topsoils for, for general landscaping applications in, in terms of the volume sizes. But then um, these more niche soils um, are going to start to be developed. Um, we've got the, the bioretention uh, grey media for the sud systems. We've got low, low fertility ones as well for species rich, diverse habitats. And then the lightweight soils for for podium landscapes. Um, I probably would add to that in terms of products would be subsoil. We talked about topsoil a lot here, but um, you, you know the subsoil by getting the subsoils to work properly for us, um, it, it takes a lot of the pressure off the, the topsoils. And as I think somebody said at the beginning, you know it's all very well supplying a good topsoil, but if it's sat onto compacted, hard, impermeable clay rubble, clay clay may ground, then you know, it doesn't matter how good the topsoil is, it, the plants are still going to suffer. So, yeah, getting the subsoils right is important as well. But I think, so So these specialist soils, their volume will be much smaller, but um, but they, they'll have their place in, in the various landscaping applications. I, I think podium landscapes um, are going to be huge. You, you know, as you say, London's London's been playing around with them for many years. I mean, I, I would say there's, I've done many schemes in Midlands and North as well, who, who've got podium landscapes. Um, and uh, yeah, certainly they add a huge amount of value to to um, urban um, public realm. Perfect. So we're now going to take questions from, from the uh, from the audience. Thank you very much, panel. Afternoon, gents. I'm really sorry. We've, we've got more questions than we've got times. So 
with the audience, thank you very much for posting those, and we will do everything we possibly can to make sure that we get back to you with the answers. But I guess there's a couple that come up quite quickly. Um, and because we are short time, just a very, very quick answer would be fantastic. So to the suppliers then, as a garden designer, what can, what, how can a supplier help them make sure they're choosing the right soil? Should we start with you then, Mark? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's um, I speak to us about understanding the application that it's been designed for really, um, and using the data that we have on our soils, finding the right soil for the end use uh, for the planting type of the scheme. Okay, John? Um, similar, so we can give you examples of where soil has been used on previous projects and if you give us indicators of what the soil has been used for, we can recommend where it's been used before and historic data. And then uh, also the data sheets that are available on our website and on our page on the Futurescape site. Okay, I guess we're going to, the, the answers are going to be pretty similar on that. So I'll just move on to another question for Tim. Um, Tim, so a garden designer doing a, a small to medium sized garden, how and when should they get their soil tested? Come off mute, Tim. Oh, well, wouldn't it? Yeah, really, should get it tested before it comes to site. Um, so, I mean, once it once it comes to site, it's very difficult to to, to obviously get it, get rid of it. So, yeah, before it comes to site, um, we, we do a simple test <clears throat> test for all the horticultural properties and contaminants, uh, provide an interpretive report and explains all the all the the, the qualities of the soil. Okay, just have a quick question while you're on, Tim, then. So in term, when, when someone, a garden designer or a landscape, receives a certificate, what should they really be looking for on a certificate? Uh, the certificate should be in date. It should be no, no older than three months old. Uh, ideally, no older than a month old if it's representing the soil they're going to be delivered with. Um, it should contain a series of uh, horticultural parameters relating to the British standard, for example, and, and some contamination tests to confirm that the soil is, is clean and uncontaminated. And, and ideally it should have an interpretation of the results to, that explains exactly how good the soil is or bad the soil is. Okay. And, and if they're unsure, is there a way that they can, is, you know, are you the guy that they should bring up and say, can you interpret this or is there, is there a way of them looking at it? Yeah, but we do a lot of interpretation of other people's analysis, um, but, but you could also go back to the person who's issued the certificate and ask them to explain more about it as well. The soil supplier should know more about their own soil than anybody else, really. Okay, okay, thanks. Thanks, Mark, for answering the one about CPD, and I guess everyone else has their own equivalent, etc. cetera. Well, so, so I guess with Andy then, so how up to date is your website with information and, and, and what people should be doing, what they're looking for? Yeah, we, we, we're updating it almost daily as uh, events may be coming. If we get new testimonials, we'll put them on there. Uh, videos uh, so no it's something we continually 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 do okay, there's a question on subs which we'll take offline and then come back back to you on um, and then I guess the, the the last thing I think John joined, joined the video and I think it's quite important here and I just wonder what everyone else thinks very quickly on this is a list of people that they've previously supplied and the testimonials how, how much you know how much is that a really good source of saying this is the right and it and I guess you break it down in terms of commercial, domestic, regional types of soil. John? Yeah, so we, we kind of stick to the top of the list as the Royal Households, and then we kind of work down from there. Um, and then we also do, depending on projects and that, that kind of thing, and the, what the soil has been used for. So normally I'd have different types of lists depending on what the soil is, because if someone wants an ericaceous soil, then I'd have the previous schemes where that's been used. Same for low fertility um, and same for bespoke mixes. So, excellent. I, I really do apologise for rushing this, but it's just the way that the agenda's fitted in and everyone's got to move on to different things. So very, very quickly, and I, and I guess just one word answer or maybe two word answer. What's going to happen to the price of soil over the next couple of months, year? Start with you, Mark. I'll go up. Um, go on. <laughs> uh, we're actually, bags are going to go down, but loose is going to go up. Okay, Andy? Project specific. Right, in terms of the pricing? Yeah. So what does that mean? The more complicated the project, the more the price? Might be. Might not be. 
<laughs> Check out his website, Drew. Um, usually they, they keep fairly standard, but um, you've got to keep an eye on things like uh, transport costs, logistics, how far they've got to go, things like when ULES came in, that's quite a big jump in transport costs for projects really right in the centre of London. So you might see that coming across more bigger towns and cities like Birmingham and so on. So that, that, that'd be quite an, an interesting watch. Okay, so the last word again on t Tim for you then. So in terms of if a landscaper or a designer wants to test soil, what's the kind of pricing that they'd have to pay? Uh, for a full British standard test, including the contamination, it's about uh, £300. Okay, and is that the one that you'd recommend? Yeah, that covers all the all the attributes of a soil for reuse, um, and that includes the report as well. Yeah. Lovely. Again, apologise for rushing it, but thank you very much, gents. That's really good, and thank you very much for the audience. As I said, we will get the questions and we will get some answers back to you on it. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Have a good thank day. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Just me and you, Andy. Oh yeah. <laughs> Pressing the wrong buttons. How are you, how are you doing? Yeah, good mate. How are you? Yeah. How's I'll the just... big boss? Are you in the office? Are you at home? Yeah, no, yeah, no, we're all in. Um we've got oh, the good. odd person sort of self isolating because somebody they know has been in contact, yeah. but touch wood so far we've managed to to dodge that bullet. We haven't had anybody as yet in here, so but um Fortunately, we had plenty of room to spread everybody out, so a lot of the teams are spread out all over the various buildings yeah, within yeah. the. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Well, we had. Uh, we've all been working from home since March. Yeah, since March, we uh, we did get back in the office for a little while, but then they closed it again because there's like three hundred 